Okay, we are now going to move on to the section about concrete existential risk reduction today. Anders Sandberg um, is a James Martin Research Fellow at the Future of Humanity Institute at Oxford University. Um, he also has a PhD in computational um, neuro neuroscience um, from Stockholm University. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you very much. So, continuing the topic of doom and gloom, but with an even more optimistic bent. So, I sometimes present myself as saying, my job is to think about the end of the world. And that typically makes journalists at least ask me after a while, after I've been talking a little bit about nuclear war and mass death, but how do you sleep at night? Which is honestly a really good question. And the answer is, of course, I sleep really well because I feel I'm doing something about it. So this is going to be a little bit about what can we actually do about existential risks. So I, I was very delighted actually by Stevens opening there with the monkey because great minds think alike. There is something very interesting to look back at our historical past. And if we go back about six million years or so to our shared ancestor with the chimpanzees, they were presumably living roughly like current chimpanzees are. Uh, hunting and gathering in the forest, may, perhaps making simple tools, trying to avoid predators. Then one branch of the family ended up on the savanna for some weird reason, while the other branch uh, remained in the forest. And these days the chimpanzees might notice that the forest is getting awfully small and there's a lot of hairless apes around. They got sticks that go bang, and for some reason there are very few predators around, and there are metal birds flying in the sky. The problem for the chimps is, of course, they don't even have historians. They can't even tell that historically the forests have gone really in a small, and they don't have a way of even noticing the situation. They don't know that their survival depends basically <coughs> on uh, human organizations and what we are doing with the global ecosystem, what we decide uh, about uh, protecting wildlife. Uh, and yet, the difference in the brain between a chimp and a human is pretty small. Uh, and that little uh, difference meant that we, uh, we could develop something like language, a pretty good innate understanding of physics that allow us to make not just tools, but uh, make chain reactions of causal event like traps figuring out things and then moving that on to others by a cumulative culture. If I get an idea, I can tell all of you, and you can, if it's a good idea, tell all your kids, and then it just goes on. And this is unique among uh, other animals. Certainly there are whale songs uh, traveling around the Pacific, but eventually they're forgotten, and the whales don't have a way of writing it down. So if there was a whale Mozart that had a really imp impressive whale song, that will be lost eventually. We humans are better and better at accumulating this, especially since we came up with the idea of writing things down, which is the reason why we're totally dominating this planet for good and ill. And typically, if I were talking about AI risk now, of course, I would point out that, yeah, and just imagine if we could get a machine that had the same slight increment in intelligence or other relevant properties, some properties which we might not even be able to think about, just like the chimp, probably can't imagine language. So that is one branch one could take. But another interesting one is, of course, where, where are we going? And overall, of course, we have ended up in this interesting situation where we have created this uh, complex world. Again, Stephen uh, beat me to it, but I think it's very worth noticing that a lot of our trouble comes from our own species. We have created a world where we actually need to care about the stability of petrostates. We need to care about the stability of our power grid. We need to care about you know, the slightly stupid people having access to nuclear weapons. And we need to care about weird systemic risks that come about because we have societies containing millions and millions of people, much larger than our natural ancestral social groups. So this might be tricky. On the other hand, we're also doing pretty well. So I borrowed this diagram from Luke So He has put together a lot of statistical apples and oranges just to make an interesting point. The Industrial Revolution seems to be one of the biggest things that ever happened. A lot of uh, important things, both good and bad, shoot up tremendously. It really changes the rules. Yes, before that, uh, we were also an important species. But now we're really changing things fast. Another interesting thing he added to that graph is a lot of disasters. Or rather, 
the disasters didn't change the, the, the graph very much. Even though the fall of the Roman Empire was a big deal and uh, probably impaired in uh, Europe for uh, centuries, it's a relatively modest effect. Uh, the Second World War was horrifying, yet it's a blip. We are actually withstanding many of these disasters quite well. Now, if you're in the doom and gloom business like me, of course, we're happy to point out that there's some disasters you can't walk away from. If there are no humans left, it doesn't matter. Uh, at that point, you can't rebound. We can rebound from quite severe things, though. So th this is a reason for hope. But that doesn't mean we should be happy about that we might be able to survive a, a new version of a Second World War. That would be something awfully bad to happen to all of us. So we would rather try to avoid that. And in general, of course, there is a lot of really interesting risks. Some of you might not be familiar uh, by, by the concept of existential risk. So Nick Bostrom defined it as um, uh, a disaster that would essentially spell the end of Earth or originating intelligence or at least severely impair its uh, potential. We could imagine something that doesn't wipe us all out, but we remain hunter-gatherers uh, on an impoverished Earth um, uh, for a few hundred thousand years and then go extinct like a typical mammalian species, while we could have had the stars. And it's interesting to try to analyze these risks, and you can do that along a lot of different directions. Uh, most of the ones I'm interested in are anthropogenic, but there are natural risks, some which are not necessarily existential but bad, like uh, solar eruptions causing uh, our power grids to break down. Uh, there are various things that are pretty unlikely, like asteroid impacts and supervolcanoes uh, uh, crashing our world. There are some things we needed to analyze a bit carefully, like risks from high energy particle physics, which does look perfectly safe, but proving this is an amazingly interesting philosophical problem. And then we have these emerging risks that we might want to steer around. Again, I could, of course, go on for a long time getting into each of these risks. There are so many wonderful and gory and fascinating and sometimes hilarious details. But let's try to be practical, or as practical as somebody from the philosophy department can be. <laughs> uh, so the typical philosopher winning move is always to abstract uh, and say, how do we think well about this question? And typically, given that we are fairly stupid, um, we do well by splitting problems apart. So we divide them into types or issues and uh, compare similarities and distinctions. So we can, for example, try to sort these risks by type. Uh, we can sort from where they're coming from. Or what is it that is actually harming? Uh, for, for example, quite a lot of different forms of disasters all act on humanity because we crash our food system. If you have a nuclear winter, or a supervolcanic winter, or an asteroid winter, or just some very bad plant pathogen, you might end up with agriculture failure lasting for 10 years, which means that we need a way of feeding everybody, or at least enough people, for a long while. That's an interesting challenge. It's also a kind of common pathway. One can also look at the different ways it works. And uh, here is one attempt uh, that Owen Cotton Barrett, my colleague, has started, and I'm working with him on refining. We can think about these risks in terms of, OK, it's something bad. Where does it come from? How does it start? And we have a natural one. We also have the ones that human create. And we can distinguish between the intentional and the unintentional one, and the ones that involve a small group of actors and a large group of actors. So we can have accidents. We don't intend it. And a few people do a very unwise experiment. Boom, something goes wrong. Of course, we can also have a problem that a small group really wants to create a big boom. So this is an interesting case because here you have a small group. They're hard to find. On the other hand, many of the trickier risks, and especially the unsexy existential risks, are the ones where everybody or a lot of people are involved. So it might be that we're just doing something stupid. We found out about the ozone hole just in time. It could have taken a few more decades. It wasn't that many researchers thinking about the problem. Uh, and uh, there was trouble with getting the data. We could have uh, had a much worse situation. And of course, we have various commons risks where we are collectively doing something massively stupid and we're kind of aware of it. Yet, well, I took the flight across the Atlantic. That was half a ton of uh, carbon dioxide. My talk better be worth it. And the problem here is, of course, how do we coordinate about this? How do we handle this because these are all about how our avoidance mechanism fails. But when something starts going wrong and now we have a response to it, 
And the question for an existential reason is why didn't we stop it if it killed us all? And one reason might be it's too large. A supernova explosion, we can't stop that yet. I have some plans, but uh, it's still far away. Uh, if something is forceful and large enough, we can't handle it. But it can also be that it's uh, something that is cascading, something growing. This is one reason why synthetic cells and, uh, and uh, cell-free uh, cultures are so nice. You can keep the reproduction under control. Uh, this is usually why nanotechnology is not as worrisome uh, in the sense of you could make self-replicators. Yeah, in principle you can, but the real problem is coming from non-replicating nanosystems that might, for example, allow people to 3D print weapons of mass destruction. We also have problems with risks that are concealed, hard to discover. And we have problems with risks that are too fast or too slow. Vacuum decay moves out at the speed of light. If that were to happen, we would not have a chance to respond to it. On the other hand, we might uh, create certain activities or uh, events that will destroy us all in 500 years' time. If we discover one of those, we would be very concerned, but probably say, yeah, but future generations will know better. They will have a better way of handling this. And the risk is, of course, we're going to be saying this all in, uh, for 499 years, and then we're going to have the mother of all, uh, all, all nighters trying to fix that problem. <laughs> But finally, of course, there is this risk might also, uh, how do you, why would an existential risk be impossible to survive? It needs to somehow get to everybody. Uh, so one possibility would, of course, be that, yeah, it's something that just wipes out Earth. It's a habitat risk. We don't have an environment we can survive in. If we get a toxin all across our atmosphere, that's a problem. It might also affect our ability to meet these risks. Uh, some of the intentional risks are scary because we might seek you out. Uh, but in general, we can analyze it like this. Now, what do we do about this? And I think generally we can split this into uh, some part. One of the most obvious things is actually we don't know that much about existential risk. Uh, there is uh, this standard thing we like to bring up, but there are way more papers about a lot of apparently pointless academic topics uh, than uh, about existential risk. Uh, the standard example is, of course, dung beetle reproduction. I like dung beetles, but we might care more about ourselves. So finding out more is actually quite valuable, especially information that would change what we do and what others do. Uh, and this, of course, means also changing priorities and finding ways around the biases. Another thing is, of course, we want the detection systems to become better. Now, notice that I'm saying detection system uh, and prevention systems rather than the prediction systems. Uh, because in general, when talking about rare and unprecedented events, it's not like you're going to be very good at predicting them. You're never going to have that many data points to fit your statistical model. It's all going to be depending essentially on your model, which means that predicting something well ahead, unless you're really lucky that it's a well-behaved risk like an asteroid, which is just obeying the laws of Newtonian gravity plus a small uh, non-linear Darkovsky effect because of infrared radiation, you can predict uh, asteroid orbits almost centuries in advance if you have good uh, data enough. But most of the risks that we really care about are complex. We will not be able to tell very well apart. Uh, so we need to weigh a way of detecting that something is about to happen and then intervening really, really fast. Uh, a lot of this has to do with coordination problems. As we heard in the previous talk, we have a global coordination problem, but we also have problem, problems in getting various agencies to do the right thing when they need it, to the right extent, and even problems of safeguarding. Uh, an awful lot of very important uh, biological and medical data exists on servers run by various university departments, uh, essentially for free as a service to everybody, and have really lousy cyber protections. That's kind of scary. The databases we really need to fight bio and, and, and outbreaks of biowarfare might be vulnerable to somebody hacking them at that point. We might want to secure them. We really want to boost that. We need, really need to fix the resiliency of our risk handling system. And then, of course, we can do various things to avoid creating more risk. We can pursue things more responsibly. Bans and moratoria rarely work, but there are other ways we can handle the information hazard generate. We can filter some of the proposals so we don't work too much on uh, impactful but stupid projects. We can uh, actually get some things safer. But I think the most useful thing is uh, also most relevant to you. We can change the order when technology arrives. When we can foresee a disastrous technology, it might be hard to prevent somebody from inventing it. 
But we can try inventing something that makes it safer. We can see that quantum computers are going to totally wreck our current cryptographic infrastructure, so we can make quantum safe encryption instead, and then hopefully roll it out before we get to quantum computers. We can see various biological risks, which suggests that, yeah, a biopanopticon, a way of detecting pathogen outbreaks really fast globally, might be a technology worth working on with a lot of nice spin off effects in medicine. So I think we can work quite hard on that. We can also boost our resiliency. We want more resources because that allows us to fix things. We need ways of ensuring trust, diversity, so we have a good problem. So we need to solve various coordination problems. We need to be adaptive. We want to spread. Uh, having a bunker it might not be the best way since the minimum viable population of humans is about 5,000 people. So you might want to have a village that's isolated. We might actually want to find ways of having people live far apart. Going to space is awesome on its own, but this is another reason we ought to do it. There are important questions about could we actually secure a food system, not just in conventional sense, but also having alternative food. Dave Denkenberg had done amazing work on showing that this might actually be possible. There's plenty of carbohydrates in this room, except that in the form of wood. But if we could convert that into something edible, we would actually have a pretty good chance of surviving the problems. So here is my last slide. Generally, I think you can make a career out of saving the world. You can work at an institution like the Future Humanity Institute or the Cambridge Center for Existential Risk, where we do actual research about the meta level. But of course, you can do direct risk reduction work, whether that is finding better Ebola vaccines or working on better vaccines in general or working on better biosafety. You can do quite a lot of interesting things also by working through the right government and international agencies. They actually need people to understand the question. And typically, career-wise, it's not just about trying to focus your career officially on the risk. Start out by getting a PhD in biotechnology or AI or what in an applied machine learning or something else that's relevant, and study and build up your competence about these other fields, and then publish a bit on it so you can get in. We also have a chance in our own life, actually, to do something practical. Uh, knowing how to make things, repair things, and, and heal people, even and, uh, if it's not uh, and, uh, that great, is helpful. Learning how to lead people by showing optimism is actually tremendously powerful. Even if, when we talk about small disasters, it's a good thing to have somebody around who is willing to uh, take charge. This is also why you should hug your neighbors, or at least get to know them. Uh, civil society is tremendously important. Most people who have medical needs in a disaster are saved by their neighbors, not by a doctor. And, and boosting and finding technological, psychological, social and other ways of actually boosting our social infrastructure makes us way less vulnerable. Adding a little bit of extra buffers uh, without necessarily going full preference is also quite useful. But generally, what we should look at is, can we build joint distributed resources? Uh, during the breakfast, uh, we were uh, debating about what was wrong with Wikipedia. Now, Wikipedia is one of the most beautiful things humanity has ever created. And it is really good, but it could be so much better. And we have a responsibility of making that better, because that's a global, shared, distributed resource that, if it contains the right information, can help us in that resource. There are many more things like that. So I urge you, in order to save humanity, invent the next Wikipedia, or clear up the current Wikipedia, and don't remember to learn the name of your neighbors. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Yeah, we're gonna. Hi. Um, I'm interested in how you talk about the value of human life in your field and future lives. So ethically, it's taken a long time to sort of expand our consensus of care and ethics, from our family and friends, to a community, to, to, the sort of, to our nation state, to the sort of cosmopolitan view where we start to respect and care for human beings, qua human beings. But how do you actually justify caring about future lives? The argument usually goes that even if you care just a little bit, the risks of, of human extinction are so large that uh, this is a huge problem that we should look at. But how do you talk to the skeptic who says that they don't care about human life in the abstract, except as it relates to their offspring or their, uh, to their family? It depends very much on how much philosophy uh, that person 
cares about. Uh, my typical quick response is saying, uh, human lives are not worth uh, less because we're far away from it, right? Wouldn't you agree? And most modern uh, educated people would agree with that. So then, of course, the next step is just point out, yeah, but far away might also mean in time. After all, we're living in an Einsteinian universe, and ethics should be Lorentz invariant. Uh, that depends very much on whether we buy phys uh, physics into philosophy. But basically, arguing that human lives are less worth because we're far away in time, I think that's problematic. But I know uh, philosophers and even people in existential risk research who actually think so. So there are many reasons why we should reduce uh, existential risk. Uh, you could make the argument, actually, it's just 7.2 billion lives at stake right now. Wait a minute, 7.2 billion lives at stake, that's pretty enormous. And even if you multiply that with a low probability, that's actually quite a lot of lives compared to many others. But then we have that the future generations might be a very, very large number. But you could also argue that we have a kind of moral compact with past and future generations. In some sense, we are caring for the legacy of past generations, and we hope the future will care for us. Now, if we don't care to maintain that legacy, what, what, uh, isn't that breaking a moral group? And so on. I can make a fairly long list of different kinds of arguments. In the end, having this kind of conversation typically requires more figuring out where is the other guy coming from? Are they thinking that there's a trade-off here between something else that matters? And sometimes they are. Uh, so, uh, but I think it, it shows that it's important to learn a bit of philosophy, even if you're not working in philosophy, because making these arguments is a quite good way of getting into a deeper conversation about what truly matters. Yeah, uh, I, I think a beautiful case in point uh, would be superintelligence. That would probably be really good or really bad, and right now we don't really know that well. But we can try to stack the deck, obviously. Uh, one of the clearest things is we could develop safe-making technologies and try to push for that. Uh, we can foresee various other risky applications of the technology and try to get the safer ones before to get enough knowledge. And typically, Many people assume that we can't decide or it's just a philosophical uh, argument, but actually it's a rational argument. You, you can start thinking about the ordering. So we don't need to worry about the sun uh, right now because we're much more likely to be hit by some uh, nearby risk like AI or nuclear war. Fine. Then we focus on those, kind of keep the sun further down on the list. Do not forget about it uh, for uh, the next billion year, but still it's there. But then you can start thinking about, are the transition risks or state risks bigger? So right now we're living in a dangerous situation in terms of nuclear war because we have a kind of fairly constant, well, it varies depending on uh, what a certain president had been watching on Fox News recently, but uh, the, the risk is going up and down, but it is fairly macroscopic. And uh, even for new uh, presidents, the US and all other countries are going to have a certain pos potential for pressing buttons. 
On the other hand, right now the risk from AI is zero, but we have some reasons to believe that it could be really dangerous if we got super intelligence. But if we survive that, everything is really fine. So that would suggest that hmm, if you believe the world is really, really in very high danger right now, you might want to go for the AI path and take that risk because that seems to be smaller and afterwards nuclear weapons are not a problem. On the other hand, if you estimate that actually nukes are not that bad of a problem, in that case we might say, yeah, we might actually want to delay things in the case of AI. Now, doing this properly requires a bit more than me doing a one-minute hand-waving up here. Uh, we want to actually think very carefully about this. But it's possible to do. One can do prioritization. Just because we're talking about really, really important things that we're very uncertain about, doesn't mean we, don't, uh, we can't think about them. In fact, we have useful methods in mathematics and philosophy and logic to do reasonable things. And then we can update it as we get more information. One of the biggest things, just to round off, regulation adds another form of uncertainty that we who are typically doing this, coming from mathematics, philosophy, and natural science, don't know very much about. We need way more policy professionals who actually understand what can and cannot be easily done in regulation. Uh, and sometimes that can really help us in, in a change that our paths rather strongly. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Yeah, so a big thank you to all our speakers. Um, if you guys have any further questions, the speakers will be here and you guys can come up and ask them. Um, right now we have the Future Tech Expo, which is in the atrium, so up the stairs. Um, thank you so much. <laughs>